ओके स्टूडेंट्स लेट मी नाउ स्टार्ट द न्यू टॉपिक एंड द न्यू चैप्टर चैप्टर नंबर टेन फ्रॉम बुक बाय अली उमर ऑन सुपर कंडक्टिविटी आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू प्रोजेस दिस चैप्टर either as a hard copy or online so let me go to this chapter and display it on the screen now that is the start of this chapter on the super conductivity super conductivity is a very interesting property of some of the solids uh, and it is an important property although we have not yet used the application of superconductors uh, on commercial basis but we have to get the basic knowledge of this property it is rather a phase of the solids uh one of the most interesting properties of solids at low temperature is that in many metals and alloys electrical resistivity when issues entirely below a certain temperature that is the resistance of the solids becomes zero and this temperature depends on the substance this zero resistivity or infinite conductivity is known as superconductivity scientists efforts to explain the fascinating phenomena have contributed greatly to our understanding of solids in general and particularly solids at low temperatures superconductivity has been applied in the design of superconducting magnets computer switches and many other technical devices in addition engineers and are proposing the area of superconductivity in the field of transportation and in the transmission of power without pollution we begin our discussion with the electrical properties of the superconductors thermodynamic consideration suggests the presence of a gap in the energy spectrum of the electron at the fermi level we next we will discuss the london theory of superconductivity superconductors electrodynamics which describes the distribution of fields and currents in superconductors this theory is extremely useful in giving a simple account of many phenomena associated with superconductivity that is followed by consideration of the microscopic theory of superconductivity due to bardeen cooper and schreiber commonly referred to as the pcs theory this theory shows that the physical origin of superconductivity lies in the interaction between conduction electrons and the ions of the lattice 
we shall also discuss tunneling phenomena involving superconductors including the Josephson effect. These phenomena are among the best known illustrations of the basic concepts of quantum mechanics. What is zero resistance? <coughs> Let us discuss about zero resistance here. Superconductivity was first observed in 1911 by the Dutch physicist H. K. Ons in the course of his experiments on the electrical conductivities of metals at low temperatures. He observed that as purified mercury is cooled, its resistivity vanishes abruptly at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. And you can see this in figure 10.1, the next page. Above this temperature, the resistivity is small but finite, while the resistivity below this point is so small that it is essentially zero. So it's very interesting. The temperature at which the transition takes place is called the critical temperature. Ons surmised correctly that he was dealing with a new state of matter below the critical temperatures and coined the term superconducting state. As the temperature above the critical temperature, written as Tc, the substance is in the familiar normal state, but below Tc, it's, it enters an entirely different superconducting state. This transition may be likened, may be linked to the familiar phase transition, such as that of vapor liquid at the vaporization point or the ferromagnetic transitions at the Curie point. Ons found that the superconducting transition is reversible. When he heated the superconducting sample, it recovered its normal resistivity at the temperature Tc. This confirmed his supposition that there was a new state of matter, one which depends on the state variable such as temperature rather than on the history of the sample. We can gain some insight into the nature of superconductivity using the three electron model of chapter 4. It was shown in section 4.4 that the resistivity of a metal may be written as this equation, where tau is the collision time or relaxation time and pointed out that rho, which is the resistivity, decreases as the temperature is lowered. Now 
because as T decreases, the lattice vibrations begin to freeze and hence the scattering of the electron slows down. The results in a longer, this results in a longer tau and hence a smaller row as indicated by the above equation. If tau becomes infinite at sufficiently low temperatures, then the transition, then the resistivity vanishes entirely, which is what is observed in the superconductivity. So, we can explain superconductivity little bit based on this equation as well. We shall see in section 10.5 that as the temperature is lowered below Tc, a fraction of the electrons become superconducting in the sense that they have infinite collision times. These electrons undergo no scattering whatsoever even though the substance may contain some impurities and defects. It is these electrons which are responsible for superconductivity. One usually measures the resistivity of a superconducting by, by causing Okay. These electrons undergo no scattering whatsoever. Okay, one usually measures the resistivity of a superconducting conductor by causing a current to flow in a ring shaped sample. That is, one can start the current by induction after removing a magnetic flux linking the ring and observe the current as a function of time. If the sample is in the normal state, the current damps out quickly because of the resistance of the ring. But if the ring has zero resistance, the current once set up flows indefinitely without any decrease in value. Physicists have made experiments to test this and found that even after several years of operation, the current in the ring remained constant, as far as they could tell. For instance, they found that the upper limit for the resistivity of a superconducting lead ring was about 10 to the power minus 25 ohms to meter. The fact that this is about 1 over 10 to the power plus 17 as large as the value at room temperature does indeed justify taking rho almost equal to zero for the superconducting state. The superconducting transition is not always sharp, but if the specimen is made up of a metallic element, 
which is pure and structurally perfect, the transition is usually short. Pure gallium per prepared under these conditions as a transition range of less than 10 to the power minus 5 degrees K. In contrast, a metallic alloy which is strained may have a broad transition range of 0.1 degrees K or more. This is illustrated by this figure 10.2. Okay, now occurrence of superconductivity. Superconductivity is not a rare phenomena. It is exhibited by an appreciable number of elements and many alloys. Table 10.1 lists most of the superconducting elements and the <coughs> and the better known superconducting alloys together with their critical temperature. Now this is the table over here where you can see both the elemental and the alloyed superconductors. Note that the critical temperatures varied, varies widely from 0 0.01 degrees K for tungsten to 20.8 degrees K for niobium, aluminum, germanium alloy. It would be useful to have a superconductor with much higher critical temperatures, particularly approaching room temperature but efforts to achieve this have met with failure. The highest known critical temperature is close to 20 degrees Kelvin and this has remained the case for a number of years, although physicists still hope that someday they will find materials that have high critical temperatures. Since superconductivity appears only in sub-substances and not in all, and since Tc varies widely, it is useful to have a criteria which indicate the expected value of Tc and the likelihood of observing superconductivity in a particular substance. The rules given below are due to Matthias who on the basis of these rules discovered thousands of new superconductors. A. Superconductivity occurs only in substances in which the valence number per atom is between 2 and 8. <coughs> in general, superconducting elements lie in the inner columns of the periodic table. The phenomena has not yet been observed in alkali or noble metals. Tool B. The valence number 3, 4.7, 6.4 that is nearly odd are particularly favorable that is they result in higher critical temperatures while the numbers 2, 4 and 5.6 nearly even are particularly unfavorable. This is illustrated in figure 10.3 in which the valence number is varied continuously in the alloy 
zirkinium, niobium, polypidinum, and plutonium. Rule C. A small atomic volume accompanied by a small atomic mass favors superconductivity. Okay, you can see the figure 10.3 now as mentioned just now. Although these rules were prescribed by Matthias on empirical grounds, some of them may be related loosely to the PCS theory. Okay. Now, perfect diamagnetism are the Meissner effect. So now we are going to study some of the properties of superconducting solids. In 1933, two German physicists, Meisner and Ochsenfeld, observed that a superconductor expels magnetic flux completely, a phenomenon known as the Meisner effect. In a series of experiments on the superconducting cylinders, they demonstrated that as the temperature is lowered to Tc, the flux is suddenly and completely expelled as the specimen becomes superconducting as shown in figure 10.4. The flux expulsion continues for all temperatures less than Tc. They establish this by carefully measuring the magnetic field in the neighborhood of the specimen. Furthermore, they demonstrated that the effect is reversible when the temperature is raised from below Tc the flux suddenly penetrates the specimen after it reaches Tc and the substance is in the normal state. So this is the well-known Meissner effect. The magnetic induction inside the substance is given by equation 10.1. <laughs> where H is the external intensity of the magnetic field, M is the magnetization in the so in this figure you can see the expulsion of the magnetic flux as the solid goes to the superconducting phase. Now, since B is equal to zero in the superconducting phase, it follows that M is equal to minus H. We have used equation 10.1 here as illustrated by the handwritten and written above this on the top of this page. So we see that in the superconducting phase M is equal to minus H, meaning that the magnetization is equal to is equal and opposite to H. This medium is therefore diamagnetic and the susceptibility is chi is equal to minus one. Such a condition in which the magnetization cancels the external intensity exactly is referred to as 
perfect uh, magnetism. So in one of my previous lectures, a student asked, what is the difference between diamagnetic magnetism and perfect magnetism? So here is the answer to his question. Now figure 10.5 illustrates the magnetization in a superconductor. Comparing this behavior with that of a normal metal, the metal is also diamagnetic if the spin susceptibility is ignored, but in the case chi is equal to minus 10 to the power minus 5, which is much smaller than <coughs> that given by equation 10.3 above, it follows that some new mechanism operates in superconductors in order to give such <coughs> an enormous time magnetism. The Meissner effect is a powerful means of shedding light on the superconducting state and it has been speculated that had the effect been discovered before 1933, the full understanding of superconductivity would have come much earlier. The Meissner effect is particularly interesting because it contradicts classical laws as well as we shall see shortly. A little bit about the critical field. Now shortly after Ohm's first observed superconductivity it was found that a superconductivity can be destroyed by the application of an external magnetic field. If a strong enough magnetic field called the critical field is applied to a superconducting specimen, it becomes normal and recovers its normal resistivity even at temperatures less than the critical temperature. The critical field depends on the temperature. For a given substance, <coughs> the field decreases as the temperature rises from 0 degrees Kelvin to the critical temperature Tc. Now the best equation which can fit to this observation is written below as equation 10.4 that Hc as a function of temperature is equal to Hc at zero temperature bracket 1 minus T over Tc scale. which holds approximately for many substances as shown in figure 10.6. So the equations suggested above is experimentally, seems experimentally working in this figure. This result is expected of course, because at T equal to Tc, the specimen is already normal <coughs> and no field is necessary to accomplish the transition. The critical field is typically of the order of several hundreds cos. Okay. So have a look at the figure 10.7 and the table 10.2 which gives us the critical 
field at zero degrees Kelvin for various superconductors. The critical field need not be external. Sometimes a current flowing in a superconductor conducting ring and which creates its own magnetic field and if the current is large enough so that it, its own field reaches the critical temperature then superconductivity is also destroyed. Okay. This places a limitation on the strength of the current which may flow in a superconductor and this is in fact the primary limitation primary limitations in the manufacture of high field superconducting magnets. Okay, let us now study the thermodynamics of the superconducting transitions. The purpose of the discussion of thermodynamics in this section is to unify the various observations described thus far even though the discussion will not lead to conclusive statements about about the microscopic force involved. Thermodynamics is essentially a macroscopic science. It will provide clues as to the nature of the transition. Now, figure 10.7 illustrates the variation of specific heat with temperatures for a superconductor. The peaking of CV just below TC indicates an appreciable increase in the entropy or disorder as T reaches towards TC and the transition to the normal state becomes imminent. Thus, the superconducting state has a greater degree of order than the normal state. So, please have a close look on this figure 10.7. Experiments at very low temperature indicate that the specific heat of the electrons in the in that high region decreases exponentially and the equation which can fit to this observation is given as equation 10.5 CV is equal to some constant A exponential minus P into T over TC. This exponential behavior implies the presence of an energy gap in the energy spectrum of the electrons. This gap which lies just at the Fermi level as you see in the next figure 10.8 prevents the electrons from being radially excitable. It also leads to a very small specific heat. The width of the gap A must be of the order of KTC because when the substance is raised to TC it becomes normal and the electrons are then radially excited. So you can see here the suggested band gap 
at the Fermi level in figure 10.8 and whose width has been expressed in equation as equation 10.7 that is delta is approximately of the order of k into the critical temperature. Now to estimate the value of delta let us substitute Tc is equal to 5 degrees Kelvin which is a typical value of one points that this band gap, superconducting band gap is of the order of 10 to the power minus 4 electron volts. This energy gap is very small compared with the gaps we have encountered previously and it is for the reason that superconductivity appears only at very low temperatures. We have noted that the superconducting state has a higher degree of order than the normal state. One may in fact view the superconducting transition as similar to the condensation of a vapor into the more ordered liquid state. Similarly, one expects a reduction in energy as a result of the transition. Let us now calculate the condensation or latent energy associated with the superconducting transitions. Now, figure 10.9 shown in the bottom here plots the critical field HC versus T. The curve divides HC versus T plane into two regions, the normal and the superconducting. Suppose that the specimen is at temperature T1 which is less than Tc. When the specimen starts at point A in figure and follows the critical path AN shown as the perpendicular that is gradually increasing the field it becomes normal at the point N. Thus the condensation energy can be written as delta E is equal to EN minus E A. This energy can be radially calculated since the specimen acts as a perfect diamagnet along the path A N. So delta E can now be calculated we can see, say that delta E is the demagnetization energy. So as the integrals shown here and equal to 1 over 2 mu naught H square per unit volume. This is the amount of energy needed to convert a system from the superconducting into the normal state and conversely it is the amount lost by the system when it makes the transition from the normal to the superconducting state. Now, since a system always seeks to be in a state which has the lowest possible energy it follows that the superconducting state is the more stable one for T less than Tc. So we can see this in figure 10.10. .10. The maximum amount of condensation energy is obviously 10 delta E is equal to 1 over 2 mu naught Hc at 0 degrees scale and occurs 
of course at t is equal to 0 degrees Kelvin. If one substitutes a typical value of hc at 0 equal to 500 cos, one finds that delta e is of the order of 10 to the power 3 joules per meter cube. A useful relation can now be established between the critical field and the critical temperature. We calculated the condensation energy in terms of the field, but it may also be estimated in terms of Tc. To do this, we must realize that only a fraction of the electrons, those lying within a shell, KTC of the Fermi surface are affected by the superconducting transition. This is because those electrons lying deep inside the Fermi sphere require much greater energy for the excitation in the neighborhood of 5 electron volts per electron while we have seen that in superconductivity energies of the order of only 10 to the power minus 4 electron volts are involved. Thus we may estimate that the condensation of effective electrons is the, given by the equation n effective is of the order of n ktc over ef where n is the total concentration of conduction electrons. Each of the effective electron acquires an additional energy of Ktc in order to be excited across the gap. Therefore, delta E is of the order of n effective KTC e equal to n KTC square over EF, which is the same as the energy calculated in equation 10.9. Equating these energies, one finds that HC0 is of the order of 2 n K square over mu naught EF bracket power half into Tc. That is the critical field is proportional to the critical temperature. So we have a very useful relation between the critical field and the critical temperature, two of the important parameters of superconductors. Thus, the higher the transition temperature, the greater the field required to destroy a superconductivity. You may readily verify the validity of this equation 10.12 by comparing the figures in tables 10.1 and 10.2. Equation 10.12 may be used to estimate Hc at 0 if Tc is given and vice versa. Thus, if one substitute Tc is equal to 5 degrees K and the Fermi energy Ef is equal to 5 electron volts and the typical value of N is 10 to the power 20 per meter cube, one point that Bc at 0 is equal to 0 0.01 Weber per meter square, which is 100 cows, which is the excellent agreement with the observed values. Okay, my students, let us finish here, and we will continue with further theoretical study, theoretical formalism, keeping in view the experimental observations in the next lectures. Okay, thank you very much.